I uh, took my jacket off, and the reason I did is because in the, I, I really appreciate those that in the first service because they let me practice on them. <laughs> and <clears throat> what I don't get right in the first service, I hopefully I can correct in the second service. Uh, since I uh, retired from ministry, I don't like that word retired, but anyway, since I'm not pastoring, it's been two years, and just before I uh, withdrew from the ministry at that point, uh, I saw a pair of pants at the store. These right here. They couldn't get rid of them, so they had $10 on them. They're mine now. <laughs> so I hung, up, hung them up in the closet, and I thought, boy, you know what? They were to a suit, and um, so... Anyway, I just kept watching and kept watching, kept going back to the store because I knew a jacket went with it too. <laughs> they couldn't get rid of the jacket either, so I paid another 10 or $15 for the jacket. So I've not worn it at all. So I figured since today I am pastoring and at least preaching this morning, I'd put my jacket on. And so my wife got up and she looked at me and she said, Oh, you look like a TV evangelist. <laughs> So, I thought maybe I better take my jacket off for the second service. <laughs> but uh, one of the ladies that was in the first service said it was like Matlock. You ever remember that show? So, you take your pick, but I'm still going to take my jacket off, okay? <laughs> I thank you so much for allowing me to have this chance since I'm not pastoring. It's always a joy to be able to share God's Word, and uh, hopefully this morning that you will also um, participate. Uh, there were some that didn't know I was going to be speaking this morning in the first service. I didn't bring my Bible. I said you should have. So I see uh, that you have your Bibles out and ready to go. So if you would, let's turn to John 3.14. Very good. And we're going to start reading. Now, I want to read to you John 3.14, and then I'm going to share a couple other things with you as well from another scripture. Just want to... Um, um, well, I cannot touch that wire or anything. Just, okay, I'll try to... <laughs> Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. For God did not send into the world, or send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him was not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Lord and His one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men have loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. I'm also prepared Even though I haven't done this all the time, for some reason I'm really I just kind of nervous and um, get dry in the mouth. <clears throat> but now that I've watered it, here we go. Ready? <laughs> Someone turn to Mark, the eighth chapter. I want you to read to us verse 33, whoever that may be. I want to see, I want to ask you if this verse is familiar. 
Mark 8, 33. Whoever finds it, read it. Now, have you come across that scripture in the last few weeks? Anybody know when? Two Sundays ago. That was the message the pastor preached. After being in ministry, two weeks ago, I heard a message preached by Pastor Jamie that I thought was superior, excellent, right on target. Now, there's a lot of ways that it could be taken but I thought that he did an excellent, excellent job. Now, I do not have a lot of authority here at the church, but I would suggest if you are able to go back in the archives, I think on your, on your website, that you can listen to that, because I think it is one of the best sermons that I've heard about authority between a pastor and a congregation, between a foreman and a crew, between husband and wife, it is very, very applicable, and he did an excellent job on that. Now, the only reason I bring that up is because I want you to think about that in reference to what we are going to share or talk about this morning. John, the third chapter, verse 14, starts out and says that people that, that as Moses had the snake as that you put it on the pole and he lifted that bronze snake up and so shall the man or so shall the son of man be lifted up if you go back to numbers which we were read it was read to us this morning the people of Israel were freed from bondage of in Egypt and when they were free, it didn't take it just didn't take them long to start complaining you know I got up this morning and the sun was shining, but doggone it, I can't see it now. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let's rejoice in it, even if it is cloudy. And it just, immediately they begin to complain, and they were saying, you know, and they started complaining against God and Moses. So, some snakes appeared and started biting the people. Well, guess what? I think we've sinned. And I think we need to ask for forgiveness. And we've spoken against God and you, Moses, and we you know, somehow intercede for us. And so God said, okay, make a bronze snake, pull it up, and if they've been bitten, they will live. Bitten by sin, and the very thing that they were bitten by, if they looked at it on that pole... They would be able to live. That's, 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 that's very interesting to me. I don't like snakes. Never did like snakes. Never will like snakes. Had a friend of mine that his father owned an orchard, apple orchard, and had a few pear trees and other things in it. And We would always go and play in the orchard. And I enjoyed it. And we'd climb the apple trees and whatever and throw apples, rotten apples at one another. You know, whatever you do as a teenager or preteen, young kid. And... We'd be up in the apple tree, and all of a sudden, he'd dive out of that apple tree, and he'd go through the tall grass, and he'd be crawling like that, and all of a sudden, he'd grab something and pull it up like this. It was a snake, and he was handling that snake. His name was Rodney. I guess it doesn't make any difference, but I said goodbye to Rodney and went home. <laughs> I wanted nothing to do with the snakes. The snakes aren't that... Wonderful of a thing. But yet, if Moses held it up, that image of the snake, the people would live. And if the Son of Man is lifted up like that bronze snake was on that pole, then we will live. Why? Because Jesus became sin for us. And as the people were sinning and complaining to Moses and God, God said, hold that snake up. And as they look at it, they, asking forgiveness, will able to live. So shall Jesus, who takes upon us, or himself, our sin, if he is lifted up, we are given eternal life. Does that make sense to you? And that's all what verse 14 says. It's just that simple. 
Let's look at verse 15. If you believe in him, you have that eternal life. Jesus became sin for us. So we are set free from that bondage of sin. Let me read verse 17. Even though I've already read them, I'd like to read them again. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let me ask you a question this morning. Now, you don't have to verbally respond to me, but I want you to think seriously about it. Here's my question to you. Why are you here? Why did you come to Word of Life? Did you come to Word of Life to show your nice outfit? <laughs> did you come to Word of Life because that's what you're supposed to do? Did you come to life, Word of Life because you had nothing else to do? I guess my question is, why did you come to the church this morning? The reason I'm asking that question is because did you come to church this morning, word of life, because you wanted to be condemned? Or did you come to word of life this morning because you wanted to be renewed in strength? Now, again, I've confessed this enough before you, and I probably need to quit confessing it and change my ways. But I'm still trying to learn the structure of how you handle your church services. But the one thing that I have come to really appreciate, and that is in the beginning, and we did it again, this, you do it every Sunday, but as you open up, you ask, for a time of reflection of what you've been doing this last week. If you have sinned or fallen short of the law, or if you have not treated your neighbor as you should, then you have that moment of silence to reflect on how you have operated this last week. And at that moment, you have the opportunity to say, Lord, I'm becoming aware of these things. I like that. Because as I sit in the pew and pastor is ready, getting, going through the children's uh, uh, sermon and that, and, and we have that time of reflection, I have that moment to reflect and say, God, it becomes quite clear. It's, it, there's no guessing about it. Uh, Lord, if, if, if I have offended somebody, you know, forgive me. Uh, God, you know, if I didn't do the right things this week, you know, have mercy on me. I'm, it's pretty clear the things that I haven't done right. You know, things that I've thought, reactions I've done. In fact, the first service I said, I see somebody and I say, ooh, they ugly. Why would I say something like that? All I need to do is look in the mirror. <laughs> and I find out that, you know what? I'm not that handsome. I'm not that debonair. I often say, before there was satellite TV, God put some on my side. <laughs> Talk with you later. But we've done things in this past week that we were, we've fallen short. And that moment of silent reflection is for us to prepare our hearts for what? Here at Word of Life. For the Word of God. To bring light into our life and our soul so that the imperfections may be dealt with. Which bring me, brings me to the verse. I never knew that preaching in a Lutheran church would... <laughs> what does verse 17 say? For God did not send His Son into the world to 
condemn. I didn't come to the Word of Life Church to be condemned. What I came here for is that the Word of God might bring light to my soul and renew my strength for the next week that I may face it and be a reflection of His holiness. So often we look at church and we think it's a terrible place because somebody's pointing a finger at me. I used to have people say to me, you know, I, I really like the church service and that was a good sermon, but it's like you were preaching right at me. Hello? <laughs> I didn't know who God had the sermon for, but I knew they were here. <laughs> In some places I'm blind. I can't see what God sees, but He knows the heart. And what I want you to understand this morning is that there is no condemnation in Christ. And when we come to this church service, we come so that we can be renewed in strength and that we can be the reflection that God wants us to be in the testimony, in the jobs, the places, the homes, the neighborhood, wherever we may be. Does that make sense? Then verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Those who believe in Christ never stand in condemnation. On the front pew, you're, you're close enough that I, you know, I can... The fact is, I may have done some terrible things last week. I may have responded the wrong way. I may have thought the wrong thoughts. But because I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I'm never under condemnation. Because I understand His love. So often, we respond with a harsh word because of frustration and all the other things. And then we become afraid to deal with it. But the opportunity is given to us each Sunday, each morning in devotions, wherever. The opportunity is there that when the light penetrates into the darkness, it reveals those things in my life that need adjustment. And the one thing that I have enjoyed at Word of Life is that each Sunday, even though I was a pastor, even though I enjoy pastoring, even though I enjoy preaching, that I can sit under another person's ministry and that I can see that Steve Higdon needs some adjustment. And I don't need to be condemned. For a long time, I said, you know what? You don't have to stand be at the church I pastored. We stood behind the pulpit, and it was in the center. But you don't have to stand behind the pulpit to be a minister of the Lord. In fact, Pastor Jamie says, go minister. And guess what? I don't have a pulpit to stand behind now. <laughs> so each week, I'm still called upon by God to minister to be a reflection of God. And in those shortcomings that I fall into, and believe me folks, it happens. I don't fall under condemnation. My wife came from a home that was pretty broken up. She had three or four stepdads. Her mom wasn't that loving. In 42 years of marriage, she still every once in a while would share things with me and Early in our marriage, we went back to her home and one of the stepdads that were there. And she said to me, strange things happen in our house. I said, okay. I, they won't tonight. She said, what? They aren't going to happen tonight. And the reason they're not going to happen tonight is because we are children of God. 
And he's going to encompass us, and he is going to protect us. That doesn't mean I'm never afraid. What it means is I know I'm a child of God. And even as a child of God, there are times that I do make mistakes, but I, in the midst of even making a mistake, know that I do not stand under condemnation. Amen. So even though you are struggling, even though you may be dealing with things in your life you never thought you would ever have to deal with before, my friend, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are and will never be under condemnation. God's Word says that. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. You ever seen a wolf as a pet? Does anybody here have a wolf pet? A lot of people have, instead of a dog, they have a wolf. And you can tell they're a wolf. Well, this family had a wolf as their pet. They treated their children right. They raised the puppy up. But they were training it and still training it, so they would leave it in the garage overnight and, and uh, take it out to the yard so it would be body trained, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and bring it back in. But they'd leave it at night in the garage. They lived in a small town, and in that small town on the edge, they began to hear a pack of wolves howling at night. That pet would jump up on the countertop or the workbench and it'd pace back and forth. That sound was familiar. It went on and went on and several weeks went by and pretty soon the more that wolf, which was a pet, which was trying to be domesticated, would pace back and forth on that workbench and the howling got so strong in that so-called domesticated pet that it took a run, jumped across the workbench into the window, smashed the window, out into the yard, over the fence, and went into the timber. That's called the call of wild. Why? Did the wolf do that, even though it was domesticated? Because it was a wolf. Its heart had not been changed. When we become Christians, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are asking God to rewire our thought patterns. We wire who we are from the evil, sinful nature did you read that in Ephesians? You did. You read it for us. Must we go back and read it again? Works of evil. That's what attracted us. Craving those natural things. You see, during the week, I begin to realize that there are some times that those natural evil things begin to creep into my life because I'm trying to deal with all this stuff in the world. And then when Sunday morning rolls around, oh man, I can get away from it. No, I can't get away from it because it comes into the church with me. That's why when I stand there in personal silent reflection, I say, God, move into my life. Prepare my heart. Change my heart, O oh God. Move deep within me so that I can hear the Word of God and apply it to my life. I'm not here feeling condemned. I'm here feeling renewed in spirit. You heard about the snake, didn't you? He was cold on a mountaintop with a hiker. They were both freezing. The snake spoke, spoke to the hiker and said, Hey, if you'll take me and put me in your pocket, warm me up. I'll show you a short way down to where we can get warm and survive this horrendous storm. The hiker looked at the snake and said, you're a snake. Maybe I might be and you're a hiker. 
but we need to work together or neither one of us is going to survive. He said, okay. So he grabbed the snake, put it in his coat pocket, warmed the snake up. He got warm. The snake said, now that I'm warm, I'll show you how to get down, get out of the storm. Got down to the end, got into the place where they could survive and shelter from the storm. Snake said, now, get me out of your pocket. We can separate now. He reached in, pulled the snake out of his pocket, and <laughs> got him right in the neck. He said, you told me you wouldn't do that. We made a deal. He said, I'm a snake. I do what's natural. You see, sin likes to disguise itself and say it won't hurt. But it will. And the only promise that I have from the Word of God is that when I see sin leaping and trying to lie to me that it won't hurt, I realize that it will hurt. I don't slip under condemnation, but I know that as a child of God, I can ask for His forgiveness. Does this? I know I ask this all the time, but you're kind of looking at me like, hmm. Because I want you to understand Folks, the reason we gather here is not so that we can celebrate church. We gather here so that we can be renewed in strength and change the world in which we live. But we're living in a world that is so condemned and so, Scripture says it, they're so evil that they're already condemned. And how are they going to hear the Word of God unless we share it with them? If we're struggling in condemnation, we cannot struggle in condemnation. We have to be able to say, yes, I am a child of God and I am free from that condemnation. No longer living under that condemnation. But Christ lives within me. So why did you come this morning? To renew your strength? I hope so. Look at verse 21, the third chapter. But whoever lives by the truth comes into light. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to have to talk to the kids. I forgot all about that's part of what you're supposed to do, so I appreciate you stepping in and doing that. But I'm thinking real quick. You said, do I have something? Well, yeah, I had something. but mm, I don't know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a mystery box. <laughs> it was a mystery to me, but I... <laughs> So I appreciate what you did. But when you expose the office, the hospital and that, you stick these things up on this big bright light, and the x-rays and all that, and you see all those things that aren't right, you see all the things that are right, because the more the concentration of the light is, the more you're able to see what the problem may be. You take away the light, and we all look like we're okay. But we're not. That's why when the light penetrates, that's why when I come to the word of life, I allow that and like that light to penetrate my soul. And there are times that I sit under the ministry of the pastor, and I'm weeping in my heart and I'm saying, God, yes, yes, yes. I want that light to penetrate me because I don't want evil to rule me. I want to be free in Christ. I want to know that there are things in my life that I need to adjust. So my question to you again is this. Why are you here? So that you can make some adjustments? So you can say, Lord... Not my will, but yours be done. I have one more thing, and I almost forgot it. I want you to turn over to Matthew. Matthew 26. Whoever has a Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew 26. That's at the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew 26. I want us to go all the way down to verse 40. 47, excuse me. Verse 47. Read verse 47 through 50. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve. And with him, a great crowd with swords and clubs, of the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the 
betrayer had given him a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man seize him. And he came up to Jesus once at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, oh. go back and start over that verse where he came up to Jesus. And he came up to Jesus and at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Go ahead. Jesus said to him, Friend. Ah, that's what I want you to read again. Jesus said to him, Friend. You have a question there. You're looking at me with a question. Say it with. Jesus said to him, Friend. Yes. What came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Judas is betraying Christ. And what does Jesus say? Friend. Even in the midst of the most horrific, horrible situation, Judas, I don't see too many people with the name Judas anymore. Why? Because there's such a condemning reference to what Judas did to Jesus and yet, what does Jesus respond with? Friend. You wonder why Judas went out and hung himself? Because at the very act of betrayal, Jesus said, my friend. The very act of turning the Savior over to the authorities, Jesus said, my friend. In the very act of Steve Higdon, in the middle of last week, thinking somebody's ugly, Jesus said, you're my friend. I will not condemn you. You see, folks, so often the devil lies to us and makes us believe that what we have done, mistake that we have make and made, is not worthy of a Christian. No, it's not worthy of a Christian, but there's a secret that we need to understand. Through the blood of Christ, we have been forgiven. If we ask Him, He is justful in faith to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all the unrighteousness. As a child of God, I do not sin, sit under condemnation. I sit under the freedom of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense to you? That was one of my Easter sermons. I just thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> but what happened was, as I was reading the Word of God, I'd never seen that before. We all hear about all this bad thing about Judas, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make him out a good fella. But what I begin to see is that even the one who betrayed him with the most horrific betrayal, Jesus was willing to reach out and say, My friend, Jesus was sent into the world not to condemn the world, but the world that the world would be saved. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to understand the importance that we do not sit under condemnation of children of God. That Jesus was lifted up on the cross and became sin for us that we would be set free. We move deeper into this Easter season. May we begin to realize that when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we make that commitment that even though some of those things that are ugly and some of those things that we think or do or respond because of pressure or whatever it may be, we feel condemned. We're not condemned. We are simply able to say, Jesus, forgive me. That light comes into my heart and my life. I can make those adjustments and I can become a better reflection of who Christ is through me. For each individual here this morning that is struggling in their life, 
and feeling that onslaught of condemnation, may they recognize that as a child of God, the simplicity of looking at Jesus being lifted up will set them free, and they will be free indeed. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.